Let's pray. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning through your word. God, as we continue to travel through this ancient letter that James, the brother of Jesus, wrote, and as James begins to wind us down to the last things, to think about the last things, Lord, I pray that our hearts and minds would realize that life has eternal consequences and that sometimes we can be so busy doing and getting to places and, 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 and trying to accomplish things, we forget about the most important, the thing that is above all things, that is you, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that, that we would be reminded of that this morning. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. If you are visiting with us this morning, we want to say welcome. We say thanks so much for joining us. It's nice to have a special treat to us having uh, Joelle uh, uh, with us, who is one of our people who have been part of UCC for many years, got married and, and left us. We're still angry about that. But Joelle is with us with her husband, Keith, and we, Henry, her new little born Henry. And so I want to say welcome to Joelle and Keith, and thanks so much for joining us this morning. We are going to continue on the book of James. Uh, Pastor Heather at Wellesley and I were talking about our sermons over the last couple of weeks, and James is a bit of a downer. You know, we've, we, we feel a little bit like we've been kind of saying kind of a lot of negative things, and, and James's letter has that kind of tone, that tenor about it. Let's uh, take a look at what we talked about last week to kind of recap to make sure we're all on the same page. Last week, we looked at this idea of pleasure. Remember, James switches gears a little bit in James chapter 4, and he uses a word in, in, the, in the first part of chapter 4, hedone, right? And hedone is where we get the word hedonism. Right? And so James talks about the pursuit of pleasure. And he talks about how this pursuit can kind of poison us to the things of the Lord. There's also another concept that comes out is this idea of God being jealous. And we took a little time to talk about God's jealousy. Because, of course, when we think of jealousy, we think of it in, in a petty kind of relational way. We think of it in a way that's uh, more human. But when, when, when James is talking about God's jealousy, is we realize that it's something more than that. We looked at this article by Mark Batterson talking about God's jealousy. And Mark Batterson says this. You can't really appreciate the mercy of God if you don't understand the wrath of God. And if you don't have a handle on the justice of God, then you aren't going to appreciate the grace of God. In a nutshell, if you don't understand one, you can't appreciate the other. When it comes to love and jealousy, I think many of us don't appreciate the jealousy of God because we don't understand the love of God. And remember we talked about, right, we talked about this, jealousy in in God's eyes is about missing us. It's about a relational connection that God wants. And, and so we talk with jealousy in a petty way, in a human way, and it, it can have a whole bunch of different connotations. But God's jealousy is that he loves us so much, right? We talk about this idea of passion, God's passion. He is passionately pursuing us. And because he is so passionate for us, he's not going to share us. In many ways, the law uh, in, in the Old Testament is really about God's way of saying, this is how you separate all of your life into these, these compartments, these categories, but keeping me at the primary, keeping me at the center uh, part of all things. And we kind of wrapped up looking at this idea of this, you know, um, action, reaction, right? Come close to God and God will come close to you. And the idea behind James wrapping up this section was saying that in all parts of our lives, whether it's a pursuit of pleasure, whether it's the mistakes that we made, and we talked a little bit about this last week, is that James says, at the end of the day, God is one of the few individuals that no matter how many times you turn your back on him, how many times you turn away from him, how many times you pursue other things, you turn back to God, he is right there for you. So that's what we talked about last week. And we are going to be wrapping up the book of James next week. Next week is our last one. And then we'll be starting um, kind of a longer uh, runway to our Easter series. And we'll talk a little bit about that next week. But before we talk about that, let's talk about death this morning. Um, uh, the Lancet, which is an online uh, peer-reviewed uh, medical journal, uh, in, in the last year, uh, the fall of last year, started this conversation about death. And my wife and I had the opportunity to be part of the uh, conversation group. So the Lancet asked different uh, people around the world to have conversations about death. And, and, and to kind of uh, send in those, uh, uh, those observations to the Lancet. And so what the Lancet wants to do is talk about how our culture views death. And this is what they kind of had to say in regards to the beginning of this whole conversation. Many people in high-income countries and those in poorer countries who are able to access quality health care have an uneasy relationship with death, unlike some traditional societies. How a society responds to death is perhaps the best measure of its health. Let's just pause there for a second. What the Lancet was saying is something that's kind of important is that as a culture, we don't really view death properly. 
And so the conversation that uh, my wife and I were a part of back in November of 2018 was the overarching theme of it was the medicalization of death. And, and, the, and the idea behind it is that um, because we as a species are living longer, for the most part, we are, we are way past what our bodies are able to handle. And so the older you get, the more things that can go wrong. It's like a car, of course. You know, a brand new car, it runs perfectly, but, you know, 10 years out, 20 years out, uh, the kilometers that are added on to it, things start to go bump in the night. And so with, with the lens it was saying is, is how do we as a society understand death and how do we approach it? It goes on to say this. Ivan Illich, the scourge of modern medicine, argued that a society's image of death reveals the level of independence of its people, their personal relatedness, self-reliance, and aliveness. goes on to say this. Illich's core argument was that pain, sickness, suffering, and death are fundamental to being human, and that the job of culture is to give meaning to these inevitabilities. And what they're saying is absolutely correct. We don't deal with death well. Death is something that happens either on television or movies or happens to someone else. But when it happens to us or it's in our realm of, of, of connectedness, we have this kind of stunnedness about us. Like, What do you mean someone can die? What do you mean that this can actually take place? Um, one of the things that's interesting about death as a culture is the conversation has changed on how we've dealt with it. In early history, conversations about death were commonplace and not fictional. There were so many things that could kill you, and your life expectancy was not much more than a few decades. When people talked about death, even 50 years ago, even 100 years ago, it was a different way of looking at it because... Let's face it, if you could survive childbirth, if you could survive childhood, if you could survive diseases, if you could survive calamities that happen around the world, then, then you were doing well. And there were so many things in this world that could kill you. But something's happened. Our culture today, with its hope in technology, has somehow reversed the conversation, and now death seems distant and something that happens to someone else. We think about death, but we think about it in an, ab- a- in an abstract way. Um, this actually was kind of interesting as I was you know, researching the next part of James. Um, on uh, third, uh, Last week, uh, a friend of mine on Facebook um, just posted that his, his father had passed away quite suddenly, had a heart attack, and he passed away. And this gentleman was uh, older, but he was, in, he was in great health. And the funny thing was, is just that morning, I was talking about this gentleman to my wife because he was a godly man, and somebody I grew up with at my, uh, my other church. And so we were just talking about how, how great of an example he was to God. And literally an hour later, I see that he passed away. So, of course, I sent a message to my friend saying, listen, I'm so sorry to hear this. Uh, just to let you know, my wife and I were actually talking about your father this morning and what a great example he was of God. But what happened was is that death kind of came to this family suddenly. There was no indication of any kind of, uh, you know, uh, disease. It was just like a heart attack and he was gone. I remember one time uh, a couple years ago, um, I delivered milk to this coffee shop in Stratford and... Um, there's a girl there uh, uh, that would uh, give me the milk order and, you know, I used to joke around with her. I actually share a little bit of faith with her as well, too. And then one day uh, I, I show up and it's a different person. I'm like, oh, you know, it's, it's so-and-so away. And, of course, you know you've asked the wrong question by the look of the person's face. It's kind of like when you ask somebody how, you know, how their dating life is going or how's their, how's their boyfriend, girlfriend. They're like, you're like, oh, if I could just crawl back into, in, and not ever ask this question. And, and they said to me, no, um, the person that you was used here, they actually passed away. They had an aneurysm. And this person was only like in their 20s, like, like young. And of course, it's like, well, somebody in their 20s doesn't die. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Not, not, not in Canada, not North America, not in Western culture, not in Western countries. This doesn't happen. But the suddenness of the death. And of course, the person that was taken over and the, and the owner of the shop, we were talking, and they were just stunned. Like, like, this does not happen. And the fact is, of course, it's not supposed to happen, but it's within the realm of our human experience. Now, this morning's introduction to our topic is a little bit of a downer, but we're going to find out that James is actually going to bring us here this morning because James wants to talk to us about uh, the consequences of our decisions, and he's going to frame it in such a way, there's, there's going to be a sentence that he's going to have in the middle of our, of our verses this morning that's going to kind of help us understand that what James is trying to help us to realize is that how we live and how we experience life has eternal implications. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to James chapter 4. We are going to take a look at the next three sections um, 
as we begin to kind of wrap up uh, the book of James. James chapter 4, verses 11 to 12 says this. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has a power to save or to destroy. So what, what right do you have to judge your neighbor? So, James has just shifted now. So he's been talking a little bit about drawing close to God and, and how pleasure can be a distraction for that. And now he's kind of shifting gears a little bit. James, the book of James, the letter of James, kind of feels like a bit of like a roller coaster, right? He's, you kind of go up and he's like, and you go, go through that. And he's like, okay, we're done. Nope, there's nothing else, right? And so the book of James has all these ups and downs. You, he really kind of shifts gears a lot, right? And so the latter part of James chapter 4, and remembering, he's wrapping things up here. And so he's going to kind of hit some topics here. And so he starts off by talking about judging. Now, what's interesting about this is that how he views judge, uh, judging and judging one another is kind of interesting because the Bible has kind of this, this, this interesting relationship with judging. Because what, what happens is, is that you realize that in the Bible, James tells us not to judge, but in other places in the Bible, we are told to judge. So the question we ask ourselves is, which is it? Right? So what is James actually saying here? Right? And for, and for example, in Matthew chapter 7, and this is probably the most famous passage on don't judge. Right? In Matthew chapter 7, again, Matthew 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. Right? Jesus' thesis statement for the kingdom of heaven. And he says this, Do not judge others and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treated others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. So, of course, as we talk to people, you say, go in the world, someone says, well, you can't judge me, right? The Bible says, judge not, lest you be judged, if, of course, if you read the King James or like Shakespeare. And so the problem is with that is that if you read the rest of the chapter, is that Jesus actually kind of says, no, no, actually, you're supposed to judge or discern or however you want to look at it, right? So look at verses 15 to 16 of chapter 7. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. So what Jesus tells us then is that you can identify people who perhaps are false in their and in, in what they're saying and how they're behaving by their fruit. And even in verse 21, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So on the one hand, Jesus tells us not to judge. But on the other hand, he says, well, you got to kind of take a look at how people are living. It's actually even more interesting because in, um, in the book of John, Jesus says this. For if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so as not to break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. So with the, the conversation and the Pharisees are trying to talk to Jesus about Levitical law, right? Can you heal somebody on the Sabbath? Let's talk about circumcision. And Jesus is like, you need to use some judgment here. You need to have, be able to have some discernment, right? And even in 1 Corinthians 5, and Paul kind of frames it in a way that's a little more concise for us to kind of wrap our minds around it. He says this, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. So we're kind of getting a little bit of a mixed message here. Are we supposed to judge or are we not? And if we aren't supposed to judge, then why does Paul and Jesus tell us to judge? Or what is actually going on here? Or is James actually talking about something different? What's interesting, and again, you have to kind of go into the original language to kind of understand what's happening here because it's kind of, it, it feels kind of complicated. And this might be one of the moments that you can kind of feel there's this contradiction, which is what our theology pub is. Like, does the Bible contradict itself? And how do we understand the Bible, right? And so there feels like, well, on one hand it says don't judge, and the other hand it says to judge. So what is it, what, 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 which response are you supposed to have? For the most common word for judge in the Greek Testament is the word krino, found 114 times. It is rendered in the English by a variety of terms, i.e. judge, determine, condemn, call into question. The word means to select and then to come 
to a conclusion, to make a determination. That's going to be important, especially what James is talking about. Sometimes the idea relates to a conclusion about a specific act or a certain person. James is making sure the church does not take salvation out of the hands of God. Go back into James chapter 11, verse 12, because look what he says here. He says, do not speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. So whatever James is talking about is evil. Not just judgy, kind of like you're judging me, but it's evil. But he also says this, um, it's, it's up to God to save. And then he kind of brings into account salvation. He alone has the power to save or destroy. Again, this is in the context of judging. The word that James uses here to judge is krino, but the addition to it is actually the context is, is don't actually say to God, this person has the ability to be saved or not. Now, look at this here. James has been kissing, don't speak evil against each other. What is the most evil thing you can say about a human being? Well, to James, the most evil thing you can say about a human being is that they are beyond God's reach. So what James is saying here is don't judge somebody. In other words, don't draw conclusions about their spiritual trajectory. Just think in your mind for a moment, the person you think is the farthest away from God. The person, there's no way that they would ever become a Christ follower. There's no way they would ever um, come to salvation, knowledge of salvation, submit themselves to God, however you want to approach the phraseology. Well, James says, if you judge that person, you may be less inclined to share your faith with them. You may be less inclined to invite them to some kind of a conversation about faith. And because of that, you, may, you actually inadvertently or you know, on purpose, you may actually kind of hold the idea of salvation or the conversation of faith away from them. And so James is saying something interesting here. He's saying, listen, just to be clear, Christ followers, don't ever think to somebody, don't ever think to yourself that this person is beyond God's reach. And don't treat them like they are ever beyond God's reach. Because if you do so, then you have now become something that you were never intended to become, and that's the arbiter of, of, of someone's salvation, someone's eternal destiny. And so the judgment that James is talking about is not the judgment that Jesus is talking about or what Paul's talking about. What Paul and Jesus are talking about is in the church, when we see behavior that is detrimental, that is, that is going to hurt the body or the individual, we in love come and we have a conversation. We say, hey, this is not what God would intend for you. This is not how God would ask you to live. And of course, whatever those conversations, whatever that looks like, that's a different conversation. But what James is saying here, when he says, don't judge, he's like, don't draw conclusions about somebody's eternal destiny because you don't know. Now, watch, look at the next part here, because he's going to actually bring a little bit more to this into and, and and play here. When we talk about this idea of judging, um, what we have to realize is that it's not just about this idea of judging, but in verse 13 to 17, he's going to bring this idea of arrogance. Now, watch. In verse 13 to 17, he says this. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do, and then not to do it. Now, there's a lot of stuff happening in this passage, and i got to confess to you, I had a lot of commentaries open on my desk to kind of figure out what the heck is James talking about here, right? Because he's talking about this idea of judging, and you're like, okay, and you go into, you get to the original language, okay, I got it. But then he kind of shifts gears, and then he's talking about going somewhere. It's like, wait, what? Like, like how is it pretentious just to say, I'm going to go to school here? Or maybe I should just, you know, go do a job there or take this job or opportunity. Why does James seem to think that this is actually opposite to what God wants for us? And what I discovered was James is not talking about making plans because, of course, we have to make plans. Right, But what he's actually talking about is the pretentiousness, the boasting. Right, That word pretentious there is actually a word that kind of denotes that you know God's mind or you know the future. Right? And, and so what he says there is that you're actually acting in a way that's opposite to what God would want. Now, watch this for a second. 
the preceding verses, right? In verse 16, it says this. Remember, James has been emphasizing humility as the proper posture of a Christ follower. Verse 16, otherwise you're boasting about your own pretentious plans. But look what he's been saying before this, right? In chapter four, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. He's been emphasizing humility. And humility simply means that God is in control. Right, we talk a little bit about this at Uptown, and we say that control is an illusion. We think we know what's going to happen, but the reality is we don't. And, and not just in this idea of death and life, but in regards to our plans, in regards to our relationships, in regards to our finances, and of course, in regards to our health. Like, like we think we know what the future holds, but we really don't. And James seems to think that when we make these grandiose statements of of who we are and what's going to happen, what we are not not acting in is a posture of humility. And so when he says, when he takes a phrase and says, you know, if, and that word if just simply means, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what, what takes place. Now, if you're a proud person and you make a plan and that plan falls apart, what's your reaction? For the most part, I think the reaction is anger, right? It's, it's this idea of betrayal. Like, how could you, God? Why? You know, and then, and then what can take place is we shake our fists at God, right? And there's so many different ways that we can approach this in, in, in a variety of kind of outcome-based faith, right? So, for example, if there's someone in your life that is close to you that loves God and you pray for their healing or you pray for their salvation or you pray that this would take place and it doesn't happen, what do you do then? You get angry at God. God, well, why would you not want to heal this person? They love you. Well, God, why wouldn't you want to save this person or, or change their heart in regards to you? God, why? And we go, and, and then what happens is we kind of can wrap up going, you know, I know what's best, God. I know how this world works. I know what takes place. And what James tells us is that's pretentious. That's boasting. That's arrogance. And the root of it, it's proud. It's, it's pride, sorry. It's this proud behavior that says, God, I know what's best. I know how the world works. And what James has been emphasizing time and time again is humility. He's been saying to us that you must be humble and realizing that um, a humble person doesn't have a plan in the sense of saying, you know, this is what's definitely going to happen. A humble person says, this is what I'm going to try, try to do or I'm going to try to accomplish. And life will happen as it happens. And, and whatever does happen God still has me. I'm with God that I, I'm still with him. And there's a line in the middle of this that's just, it's just reason why I've been thinking about this idea of, of preparing to die, right? Because James says something interesting here. He says, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. Uh, Stephen J. Cole, who wrote a commentary on this chapter, said this, you would think that because death is not just probable, but absolutely certain, and that it can happen at any minute, and that each person must stand before God for judgment, every person would be desperate to know how to get right with God. But strangely, people put it out of their mind and go about life as if they will live forever. George Bernard Shaw says this, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people will die. So what James is saying here, and what Stephen J. Cole is kind of pointing out here, is we have taken this idea of death, and we have said to ourselves, I'm going to live forever. And the younger you are, the more arrogant you are to make that statement. One of the things that uh, was very formative for my wife and I, and I've shared this a little bit, but our daughter Talia, uh, when she was born, she was diagnosed with a heart condition, and we were told that she would need a heart transplant. And so what took place then is we would, we would have to go to sick kids in Toronto to have a lot of appointments and the doctors would tell us about heart usage and all the stuff that I had no idea. My wife, thankfully, was a nurse, could kind of explain a little bit to me. But you know, we, were, we were told every time we saw these doctors and the prognosis was grim. It was, it was grim. And when you go to sick kids, sick kids is a phenomenal hospital and what they do is absolutely incredible. But you are, you are encountering the frailty of life because these are you, you, you walk on the floor and you see children with tubes all over the place. You see children with loss of hair from chemotherapy. You see children who are in different um, uh, places of, of, of pain and suffering, and you realize something. Life is fragile. 
Right? Life is fragile. You, 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 you don't really understand that until you walk into a children's hospital and you see the most, what are supposed to be the most healthy, the most vibrant, the most uh, alive people in our, uh, in our culture, children. Right? Of course, children are supposed to make noise, supposed to run around, supposed to be happy, supposed to be playing. And of course, these children are brave and, 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 and they are doing, they're experiencing life as they can. But you see that in the sense of like the frailty of their life. And so what James is telling us is that your life is like a fog. Right? It's like this realization that you think that you're going to live forever. You think you know the destiny or the trajectory of your life. But James is saying only the arrogant and the proud really believe that. Right? Like you don't know how many years you're going to live. You don't. And it's not a, you know, like, like beware, you walk out the door and get hit by a car. But it's a reality of like if you believe that life is fragile, if you, do, if you believe that your life will come to an end, what Stephen J. Cole is saying is important. But strangely, people put out of their mind and go about and, and go on as if they live forever. I've talked to many people who say, well, you know, I'll get right with God when I'm 60 or when I'm 70 or on my deathbed. And it's like, wow, great to know you actually get a deathbed because many people don't get that. So have you already got a bed picked out? Is it a posture pedic? Does it, does it have like the motor go up and down? That's fantastic because I'm not sure, you know, if I'm going to have a deathbed, right? And so we have this idea that we'll get right with God or we'll figure things out with God when we have nothing better going on, right? When, when nothing else is taking place in our life, we'll, we'll get ready with God. And, and so James is saying, listen, just to be clear here, and, and not to be too overly dramatic, but you really don't know what life holds for you. And this, this idea of saying, you know what, I'll, I'll figure things out with God later, or I'll set this aside later, or I'll think about this later. What you're basically saying is you're kind of rolling the dice and saying, well, you know, I, I'll figure things out with God. And we're going to come back to this towards the end there. But remember what James has been saying. Your behavior, faith and works, it has eternal consequences. Right, what does James say time and time again? Right? Show me your faith, I'll show you my deeds. My deeds are going to line up with my faith. So that when I stand before God, both there is no hypocrisy, there is no inauthenticity in my life. My, my, my belief and my behavior are aligned. What James is kind of attacking, what he's kind of uh, calling into question is your belief not lining up with your behavior. You know, James says, remember, he goes like, you know, it's, it's fine to say you believe in God. Even demons believe in God. Right? So, like, why is it you think that your belief is going to somehow save you or, 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 or get you towards what God would want for you? And so he's saying to us something important. He's kind of reminding his reader this, that however you want to understand your life, just make sure you realize that you don't know the future. And if you don't know the future, live as if God is right now for you because you don't know what tomorrow brings. Now, we switch over to chapter 5 now. In chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, again, James does, he shifts the gear again. And he says this, look here, you rich people. And you're like, wait, what? We were just talking about this. Now we're talking, okay, James, I'm with you here. What, what, what do you got? Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. Wow, James, a little bit dramatic there. You know, just a little bit dramatic there. You know what's interesting? Is when people are asked, what will make you happy? Or what will make you, you know, your, your experience life better? The majority of people will respond with, well, I just need more money. And then the next question is, well, how do you get more money? Well, I need to win the lottery. If I just won the lottery. And, and, and it's so funny. People will go, well, I don't want to win the entire lottery. If I could just win like a little piece of it. I don't want the 60 million. That's just, that's just gross. I don't need that. But if I can have 5 million, and if I can have $5 million, or if I can have $1 million, or if I can have more money, well, then I'll be happy. That's what's going to make me happy. Right? And so what's interesting is that we have said to ourselves, as a culture, as a society, intrinsically or extrinsically, however you want to approach it, that if I just had more stuff, yeah, that'll make me happy. Now, look how James kind of responds to that. And his language is very um, visceral. It's almost as if James has watched an episode of The Walking Dead, 
And he's describing one of these zombies, right? Because look what he says here, right? The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. But then he says something kind of interesting. He says, this corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. Now, how does money speak against you? <laughs> right? Like, like, oh, he was using me for bad things. Or, oh, like, like, how does money testify against you? What James has been more interested in and what we've talked about is we have to go from the surface down below because what James is really interested in is our hearts. He's been talking about external things that reveal internal realities. And now the last one he's going to touch on before he wraps the letter up is now our money, our wealth, our resources. And he says, do you know why your money will testify as to your true spiritual nature? Because money is one of the few things that you get to do what you want with it. Now, I say that, and some of you go, well, I have a mortgage. I have a car payment. Yeah, of course. You chose to buy the house. You chose to buy the car. No one forced this bill upon you. Right? And so, of course, you have a mortgage. And, of course, you have a car payment. Or or you have student loans. uh, Or however you want to approach it. Of course. But that doesn't usually take the entirety of what you earn. And some of you can say, well, it's pretty close to it, and that's a whole different conversation. Maybe a financial counselor might be a better uh, way to look at it. But James is saying, money is interesting. Wealth is kind of an interesting thing because it actually reflects more of your values. We talked a little bit about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about, you know, how Canadians spend their money. And we talked about charitable giving in Canada, right? And we said that in Canada, the average person will give... uh, I think it was 3 point something, 3.5% of, of their income or, or, or something like that. And then we said that people will spend about 7% of their income on alcohol and will spend about 10% of their income on eating out, right? And so what, it, what was interesting is how we look at our spending habits and what James is telling us is that the reason your money or your wealth will testify against you because it will really tell you what is important. What, what is interesting is that uh, if I don't know anything about you, you just show me your bank account and you show me what you spend your money on, Well, I'll know exactly what you think is important. I'll know exactly what you believe is important. Because this is what you will spend your money on. This is what your wealth will do. And this is why James says, your wealth will testify against you. Because it will show everyone what exactly is important. Now, watch this here, okay? So, as the end of the letter approaches, James shows the last area of pride that needs to be dealt with our wealth. I love what Augustine says. He says, God wants to give us something but cannot because our hands are full. There's nowhere for him to put it, right? So we trade in the spiritual gifts that God wants to give us for the financial gifts, right? And God wants to give us stuff, but we're so full of other things that like, God has no way of doing that. And so the last area of, of absolute pride and arrogance is wealth. And we see this. Those who are wealthy, those who have affluence, those who have... And again, wealth can be seen as as financial, but it can also be seen in in our culture, especially as status as well. All these things show what we really are, right? It's so rare to see somebody of affluence, of wealth, act in a way that's humble. Like, we are so amazed when we see an athlete who makes millions of dollars act act in a way and behave in a way that's not arrogant or proud. We're almost shocked. We're like, What? You mean somebody will actually behave and act in a, in a human way and rather than, you know, you know, buying a bigger house or, or, or going on an incredible vacation? Like, we, we're, we're, just, we're, we're just astounded. I remember reading this article, and please forgive me because I'm, uh, I'm not going to get it all right, but this picture for the Jays, if I'm not mistaken, if I am, um, who cares? Um, this picture for a major league team basically uh, bought a van to live in for the summertime and just traveled around, and he lived out of this van. This is true. Uh, I I don't know who he is. I don't know what team he played for, but the whole story is true. Not like, you know, stories pastors kind of make up sometimes, right? So this one is true, right? But what was interesting about the the article is that this guy has a multi-million dollar contract, but he decided he just wanted to travel around in this this kind of Winnebago, kind of Volkswagen-y type of thing because he just, he that that was enough for him. And I remember reading the article, like, how, how refreshing, how interesting is it for someone not to allow the pretension of wealth, the arrogance and pride of wealth, affect them so that they believe that they deserve or owe or, or are entitled to a certain type of lifestyle. But now, look, let's go on here. Because now James is going to shift gears here. For listen. For listen. 
Hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who, who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourself for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. So now James goes from just those who are wealth, uh, uh, people of wealth to people who actually are perhaps owners of, of companies or owners of businesses or people who are employing other people. And he says, listen, just to be clear here, God is not okay with you taking those who work under you and abusing them or treating them in a way that doesn't, doesn't show the dignity of, their, of who they are in God's eyes. And so he's saying something so interesting. He says, you have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. Basically, social media is our way of kind of seeing into the lives of these incredibly beautiful, rich, powerful people. And we become envious or we become overly obsessed or we are so interested in what's going on with Tristan Thompson right now or, or, or the Kardashians or, or, you know, just whoever, right? We're so fascinated by their lives because this, this lure of wealth and beauty and power and fame is just so attractional for our culture. It's so vacuous, so, so shallow, which is our culture. And James says, listen, just to be clear here, those of you who are owners, those of you who own businesses, how you treat your employees, how you treat those underneath you, God's actually interested in, in that. It's, it's not as if it's arbitrary. Now, remember something here, okay? The book of James, the letter of James is written to the early church. It's the first letter to be distributed you know, uh, why? Remember after the, in, in Acts chapter 9 there, the scattering of, of the early church? The letter of James is the first one to go out. That's why it's way more Jewish than the other letters that go out, but it's also more behavioral. Because James wants the scattered Christians to know how to behave in the Roman Empire. And some of these people who are scattered are wealthy. And James says, you know what? Just to be, just to be clear here, we know how the Romans treat their slaves, we know how people who are wealthy treat those underneath them. But maybe if we as Christ followers would have a different value, a different way of looking at it, maybe that might speak more to the culture than other things we talk about. So if it's a business owner or somebody who's wealthy or somebody who has affluence, how do we use that? And again, to go back to our wealth, our status, our affluence will testify against us. Let me wrap up here. What is tempting about this passage is to assume that James is talking to someone else, but this is the trap and exactly what the proud might say. See, in this room here this morning, there are a lot of students, and we love our students at Uptown Community Church. You have been a part of us since the beginning, and you were with us for a certain period of time, and you, you will leave us or stay. We hope you stay, but you know, you go back home, you, go out, you graduate, and we miss you. You should write a little bit more. Anyways, um, a student can say, well, I'm not wealthy. I've been eating macaroni and cheese for the last two weeks, so I don't know about this wealth thing you're talking about because that ain't me. What James says, and it's a trap that we have to remember, is that if you live in Canada and if you are a student in Canada, then you are the wealthiest 20% of the world. And that's something that kind of messes with our mind a little bit, to think that there is 80% of the global population that has less than you and you think you have nothing. It's like, What? How is that even possible? Because I'm eating ramen, and I and that like I, I and like no no no, you need to understand that if you live in this culture, if you live in this country, that you are the top twenty percentile of the world's wealthy. And the trap can be that well, I don't have a lot of money, or I can't afford even a, a coffee, or I haven't had Starbucks, and I. It's like no no, that's not what you're saying here. Our wealth is not just seen in our finances; it's in every aspect of our lives. And if we say that, like what James says, is that however we approach it, it is something that we need to use in a way that honors and respects what God has for us. James started by lifting up humility as a proper posture of a disciple of Jesus. He has then showed three areas, judging, pretension, and wealth, as the opposites of humility. And that's the point. Is that what James is trying to show are three areas that are the opposite of what a humble Christ follower. What does Jesus say to his followers? Take up your cross. Remember, he has said that before he's about to take up his cross. 
He says it to a group of people who know what taking up the cross means. And everyone's sitting there going, well, okay, Jesus, I'll take up my cross when you do. And Jesus is like, I know. You, you wait. You know? And so the idea of a, of a Christ follower is not pride. It's not proud. It's not entitled. It is servant. It is someone who sacrifices for others. It's someone who looks at the good of others as greater than themselves. And what James has been trying to say, and this has come through in a different ways through the entire letter, is that he's helping us to understand that life is fragile. The problem with wealth is, the problem with what we own is, is that it is a trap. And time and time again, this is the, this is the message that comes forward, whether it's in 1 Timothy or Matthew or in Luke. The, le- the, the lesson is that wealth is a trap. And it's a trap that pushes out the things of God. See, if you were affluent, if you had that $5 million, if you won a $5 million lottery, all of a sudden, you go a little bit crazy. And by crazy, it means like, ah, I get to buy whatever I want. I don't have to think about anything. You know, like, I don't have to worry about my, my debit card being declined. Yeah, you know, it's like, like you, you kind of go crazy. But the thing is, though, is that all of a sudden, I have all this wealth. I don't really need God anymore. I don't really need faith anymore because now I got everything I need or want or desire because now I have all this money. It's kind of the feeling you get, and this is kind of a comical illustration, but it's kind of true, is when you get your paycheck, right? The, the, the day you get your paycheck, you're like, oh, I feel wealthy. But a week later, like, where did it all go? You know, you're like, where did, where, where, where's all this money? I felt so wealthy and powerful, and now it's like I'm, I'm trying to find some loose change to be able to buy something, right? It's like, okay, wait. So what James is saying and what the Bible tells us is that wealth is a trap and that it can master you, it can control you, it can, it can, it can um, distract you from the things of God. This is why the early church, the gospel was so attractional to those who were marginalized, those who were uh, poor, those who were suffering. Because the gospel is good news to those who have nothing. The gospel is inconvenient to those who have a lot. Because it speaks to how we use our resources. It speaks to how we use what God has given us, whatever that would be. And so James is trying to help us understand this at the last part of his letter. And what he's really trying to say here, in verse 14, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, but then it's gone. But you know something I noticed when I went back through the letter after reading this and thinking about this? James has been saying this throughout the entire letter. He's been trying to help us to understand something, that your behavior now, right now, not tomorrow, not yesterday, right now, it has eternal implications. And this is the part that James is trying to help us to align again. Because it's so easy to believe that what we do now, what we experience now, it's, you know, it's not, it's, you know. But he's been trying to tell us time and time again that we will, we are, finite we are on this planet for x amount of years but however long it is even if you hit the 90s it's still like a speck in time and those 90 years those 60 years those 50 years and whatever it would be it's like one long exam and i know that can make you kind of groan a little bit make you kind of be petrified a little bit but it's 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 a test when I remember talking to an, uh, someone who was very angry with God, and they said to me that, you know, the thing I have, the problem I have with God the most is God sending somebody to hell. It's, it's a great statement because it, it says something, right? That we stand before God and God has this leader, right? It's like, oh, you know, the trap door opens and there's like, ah! And they're like, I don't know. And uh, the pastor speaks too fast or you know, whatever it would be, right? It's like, like, like we have this leader and God's like, oh, I don't, you know. God sending someone to hell. And I said to that person, I said, I get that, that impulse. I get that idea. But what if you reframed that, uh, that moment? You stand before God, and God doesn't send you anywhere. God just says, the life that you lived on the earth, you can now get to live in eternity. And on earth, you decide to live for yourself. You decide to indulge in every pleasure. You decide to ignore me. You decide to ignore everything about that. And that's how you will spend eternity. 
Or you stand before God and goes, I know you. We spent time together. We, we, you, you read, you heard, I remember your prayers. I remember when you prayed when you were in school. I remember when you were praying when you were married. I remember when you were praying when you had kids. I remember when you prayed, like you were always thinking of me and I with you. And now this is what your eternity is because it was with me on earth and that will be with me in eternity. And I said to the person, rather than seeing God have this, this lever and this trap door, which is all very dramatic and all very middle ages, why did you think about it this way? That God, when we stand before God, God just says, as you've lived on earth, now you live in eternity. And whatever decisions you've made, I now acknowledge those decisions now. And because James is trying to tell us that we are fragile, we are frail, we are beings that have a beginning and have an end in our physical, uh, in our physical beings. And because of that, we have to realize We have to realize that our, our actions have consequences. And it's not even so much the earthly consequences that, yes, of course, we want to make sure that we, we live our lives in a way that uh, mitigates that. But what if we started thinking about the eternal consequences of our lives? What if we started realizing that how we view God and how we view our relationship with God right now will actually affect the future? And this is kind of a theme that Jesus talks about, but also um, it's, it's kind of brought up forth in the Bible. I'm going to close with this. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says this, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will either receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. That is both sobering and terrifying. Because I have to confess to you as a pastor, as a Christian, as somebody who's followed Jesus for many years of my life, I still have this part of me that's like, I have a responsibility to use what God has given me to serve him. It's never a pass that is given to me. But instead, that I have to every day choose Jesus. I have to choose God over myself, over my pleasures, over my desires. I love what Jesus says in John chapter 6. He says, they replied, again, these are people trying to, trying to negotiate with Jesus about heaven and, and eternity. He says this, they replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Now, this is kind of an, emo, uh, an incredible statement. This is the only work God wants from you. Believe, and in brackets, we have the Jewish understanding of belief, and I'll unpack that in a second. Believe in the one he has sent. Remember we talked about this a few uh, weeks back? James has been talking about belief and behavior. And James says that uh, our belief should reflect our behavior. And that is a perfectly Jewish statement. Because it's in Western, uh, it's in Western culture that we talk about belief as this abstraction. I believe and I think these deep thoughts. But to the Jewish person, it's I believe and I behave. I act out of my belief. And so when Jesus says... Um, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. If you believe that Jesus has been sent by God, then your behavior has to be altered. If your behavior has not been altered, then you do not believe. To get backwards. If your life resembles everybody else in this culture, the question I have for you, the question I have for myself, please hear, I have to apply this to myself first. Is it, have you really encountered Jesus? Or have you encountered something else that's a facsimile or, or a reproduction or something altogether different? Remember what James says? I'll show you what I believe by how I behave. Right? This is a paraphrase from James chapter 2. Show me your belief. I'll show you my actions. And this is the part that James is trying to help us to understand. Our actions, our behavior, our lives right now, they have eternal implications. James tells us we are like mist of fog. If you've ever gotten up in the morning and you've seen kind of that mist, that fog in the morning, right? You can, you can take a look at it, but literally in, in like a minute, it's gone. And James says, that's what your life is like. You think you have forever to decide to follow God, to choose God, to, to, to pursue God. And James is like, just to be clear, you don't know what the future holds. That's pretentious. That's pride. That's arrogance to think that you have all the time in the world to get right with God. Right? Like, like, 
once I'm married, once I have a job, once I have, you know, this, or I have this house, or I have this, this career, or I have this income, I have this, then, then I will think about God. Then I will, I will get my, I'll get my act together with God. And James says, if you don't do it now, you're most likely not going to do it in the future. And this is why this morning we start off talking about our death. And not because we want to be morbid, and not that I ever want to manipulate you by fear. But to remind us, however we view our lives, however we view eternity, we have implications. We have consequences of our actions and our behavior. And whether we like to think about it or not, those consequences, those implications have eternal consequences and implications. Let's bow our heads, let's pray. We do this every week, and I, um, I just want to give you an opportunity to reflect. Um, I, I, I do want to apologize a little bit this morning, because this sermon this morning is a little bit heavier, and in the sense that it's, it's a little bit morbid, in the sense of talking about your death. Nobody wants to talk about death. Nobody wants to think about it, but James brings us back to it, because James wants us to remember, we are human, we are fragile. Life is frail. Control is an illusion. You don't know what the future holds. You don't. And of course, I'm sure James and myself and any other follower of Jesus just wishes that things go well and always, always going to go well. But we know that life has a way of throwing us curveballs that we, we just never anticipate it. And these curveballs, these bumps, these roller coaster rides, James tells us these are what reveal what's really in our heart. Because in the midst of the storm, if you trust God, you trust God in the storm. But if you don't trust God, the storm reveals you don't trust God. And so James is trying to help us understand that our behavior, how we live our lives, it has eternal implications. And he just wants us to pause for a moment. He wants us to reflect for a moment to make sure that we have things aligned. Education, relationships, careers, all these things, family, these things are fine. These are important. But these are not the most important things. The most important thing, the one thing, is God, is Jesus. It's the one thing that will transcend this life into the next. And we have to think about that. We're going to have an opportunity now to reflect and, and worship. And uh, the team will lead us again. And I just want to take this opportunity this morning to kind of have that, uh, that time to reflect. Because sometimes what can be revealed in, in the reflection is that we, are, we have been living our lives for ourselves. We have been living our lives for our own pleasure, for our own gain. And we have to kind of realign that, readjust that. So as we sing, as we worship, as we reflect, just take that opportunity um, in this uh, last part of the service.